Hi, and welcome to the Focus episode nine. I'm Aldo Rol. And I'm Horia Slushansky. Welcome. So in today's session, we are going to um, cover the third installment uh, of covering the uh, explore and innovate and uh, uh, maintain com uh, competent capability uh, balance um, as part of our adaptive oversight galaxy view. The third installment is where we're going to be looking at that tension between following new rules, but again, changing those new rules that, uh, that, that we've um, had before. Now, just as a recap, this whole tension is about dynamically balancing um, uh, change uh, at the, XD, the, the pace of change um, that's required to flourish. If you go too slow, it's very risky. You would be disrupted. And if you go too fast, you lose control of the change. So, Horia, can you just recap what today's, uh, why, what is the focus of today uh, when we talk about follow the new rules and change the rules? Okay. Now, remember in the previous two um, varieties of explore and innovate versus maintain competent capability, we looked in the first one from the perspective of the oversight function, uh, in the second one from the perspective of the uh, initiative engaged in the work. Now, this third one is a combination of both. In other words, the oversight function wants us to follow the new rules that we've established in this more adaptive way of work. And the initiative usually wants to change the rules a little bit because, hey, uh, we're meeting all sorts of um, obstacles and constraints. And therefore, there will be some level of friction between follow the rule, follow the rule, follow the rule, and we've got to change the rule because the rule isn't serving us quite well enough. So that's the intention. How do we combine both our capabilities such that we can both sustain the discipline and the rules that we've established for us, and at the same time, invest in polishing, adjusting, changing the rules so that we get them to serve us even better? How do we get even stronger? So this is quite a nuanced uh, balance because what we find is, is that once you get the oversight community to actually agree to a new set of rules, the teams go and want to change them again. So, <laughs> and, and that's quite a tension. You've convinced the decision makers that we need a new set of rules or new ways of working, and then they want to go and change it again. So, and again, it's like, but you've just changed this last week and now you want us to change this again. It's talking and exploring that specific tension. So just to recap again, how we're going to step through this, if we look at the polarity map, is number one, we are going to there at the bottom left corner, is we're going to look at the current struggle patterns for following new rules that we've established recently. Then we'll look at the desired outcomes when we change those rules again. We also then thirdly uh, at the bottom right there is then to look at the risks when we overcorrect on the actual um, uh, uh, changing the rules just willy nilly. And then we will be moving to what benefits do we retain from not changing too fast from following the new rules that we have established recently. We'll then look at what's the upside of both. How would a healthy balance look like between this tension of follow the new rules and then change the rules? What's the overall gains, greater purpose statement? And then we'll look at what are the potential fears, the double downside of this. What are both camps fearing the most and when we have an imbalance between these two? Then we'll look at what are some of the actions and skills that you can um, that you can implement or uh, consider to remain above this uh, this line to look at uh, that, that balance. And then what are the measurable warning signs or early warning signs that you um, need to look out for? to show you that one of these two balances or one of these two poles 
are actually falling uh, back into the uh, risky areas, the struggle patterns and overcorrections. So let's jump into this straight away, looking at the actual uh, struggle patterns for following the new rules. Aurea. Right. So as I alluded to earlier, there's a potential friction between the oversight community and um, the people engaged in the work. Um, the oversight community, because it is engaged in a structural power imbalance, uh, they are the people with the authority, most likely. They will usually want to have the last word. Say, no, I'm calling the shots. Um, you must do as I say. Regardless of the fact that the people actually engaged in the work are noticing, well, no, uh, we can't do this because there's this obstacle um, in front of us. So um, when there are um, power gradients and um, ego um, clashes, we get this um, depletion of safety, depletion of respect, uh, escalation of tensions, uh, passive aggressive behaviors, and so on. So that's uh, a whole suite of, of challenges in terms of friction. We may also have friction of unclear purpose. In other words, yeah, um, you want us to follow this rule, but why? Uh, if we're not explaining for people, why is it that we have such and such a rule? Why is that rule beneficial? How is it making us better, more competitive, more effective, more impactful, um, then we may have some challenge. Now, we mentioned here this idea of the curse of knowledge. Um, suppose I get promoted in my organization because I'm really um, competent. I know inside and out a particular problem domain and uh, I gain more uh, prestige, I get promoted. I, I know a lot of stuff, but I forget that not everybody has the same breadth of perspective. And therefore, when I make uh, a snap decision and I have this idea that I already know what needs to be done, a lot of people may notice different things from new perspectives. And I miss that because I'm no longer in that position that gives me direct access. So therefore, um, I'll, I'll have a clash with the people engaged in the work become a little bit um, mismatched. So when our purposes are a little bit unclear because our perspectives are unclear, then we may have some, um, some trouble. We may also have uncertainty. Um, when I follow the rules, you're telling me I'm supposed to follow this rule, but, but why? What's in it for me? Um, I don't see how this is going to uh, do um, any, uh, any good for me. It might give me uh, more risk than, than anything useful. So the uncertainty, um, and sometimes there are cultural um, implications. The culture itself may not be permissive enough for people to try new things. There's an expectation that you will just uh, do what you're told. That in itself may give us Difficulty. Now, there could also be weak alignment between the people engaged in the work and the people in the oversight function. In other words, some people have certain expectations as to um, how the work is supposed to be done and what process uh, flow is supposed to be used. Um, often you will see uh, people saying, um, and you will use blah, blah framework insert name of uh, favorite framework here uh, instead of blah, blah. Um, and uh, different people have different interpretations of what that means and with what degree of zealotry, shall we say, must that framework be uh, adopted. Um, I've served for quite some time as a, as a methodologist for my sins, and I've discovered that most of us methodologists suffer from the same curse. Um, we are in despair when we devise a methodology and we're hoping that people will tailor it to their context. And almost invariably, uh, people take the whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel, and try to plonk, uh, use the whole thing. Forgetting that no, uh, different situations require different uh, contextual 
adaptations, and you can't afford to have the same rule across the globe for everybody. It needs to be consistent. No, 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 no. Each situation requires a different approach. So when we have weak alignment, we have all sorts of, um, of difficulty. Now, there might also be um, the, the context uh, may lack sufficient clarity. In other words, there might be a number of silos engaged in a particular initiative, and me, I'm in my silo, you, you're in your silo, and I'm not aware of what's actually going on, and the oversight people don't do a good enough job of uh, ensuring that we understand each other's constraints and, uh, and obstacles and challenges. So um, when our our contexts aren't clear. Uh, the culture may also prevent us from getting messengers um, to, to communicate across. Uh, you may have seen this in other organizations where uh, people in position of authority say, no, 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 you're not allowed to talk to my people. You're not allowed to distract my people. They must follow what I tell them. They must follow my rules. You can't go ahead and, and talk to them and maybe give them strange ideas about changing the rules. No, 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 you're not allowed to. So, whoops, um, we have difficulties of context. Um, see how this also leads into um, selfishness, right? Uh, you, you may recall we had a whole tension on personal interest versus organizational purpose, but um, selfishness can, um, can interact here as well. And finally, um, we have um, sloth. As a uh, as a struggle pattern, when the the wrong behaviors get incentivized and people um, hide behind the process, and it's so easy to just chop things up to the too hard basket, or um, you have um, strange red, amber, green reports um, subject to the watermelon effect. Remember my, it's green, it's green, it's green. Oops, it's red. Kind of situation. Yeah. So. Lots of difficulty in just um, following the rules without contextual adaptation. Fortunately, however, Aldo can give us some, um, some desired outcomes. What might happen if we change the rules well? And again, it's not change for the sake of change. This is really talking about having real discipline about how you go about the change that you that you bring in, any any new ways of working or any new rules that you implement. Um, first thing that we notice is that there's unity. Um, so a panel uh, that we interviewed that uh, um, bring out a lot of aspects around unity. There's that wanting mindset. Uh, they they have that really strong ownership and, and shared responsibility within the team, not just the team, but also between the team and the oversight function as well. Um, the all way also very strongly related to that is you'll see an harmonious set of interactions. You'll see the interactions, you'll be able to observe that many of those interactions are harmonious. Um, if there are disagreements, it's still happening in a harmonious way and it's handled in a really mature way. You also see radical transparency. Um, so anybody can go look at anything, uh, what the oversight function is doing, as well as what the actual uh, people working on the initiative is doing. Um, we talk about their duplex Gemba um, to explain that phenomenon is not only can management go down onto the shop floor and have a look at what's happening there going to the Gemba, but you have a reverse Gemba as well, where uh, anybody on the shop floor can go and see what uh, is happening, where the decisions are make, made, how those decisions are made, etc. We call it duplex Gemba. What we also notice there is quite a lot of clarity around the Kinevan context. So people understand, um, first of all, what Kinevan context they find themselves in, whether it is simple or uh, chaos or whatever, they've got real clarity about that and they know what their responses are supposed to be. They're also comfortable with being, uh, with ambiguity, comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, that we notice there. You also see that their responses is appropriate to the actual context uh, 
the, the, they can even um, domain or dimension that they find themselves in. So we also noticed uh, aspects of ingenuity and uh, around improvements. Um, there's quite a, lot, quite a lot of cultivation of those new ideas uh, in terms of giving it enough legs, uh, giving it enough space and air time to actually evaluate it in a neutral way. This act of hunting for blind spots and biases, people actually notice dogma and actually call it out um, when in a safe way, uh, when any of the two parties, uh, the, the oversight function, as well as the people working on the initiative, it's called out. And then lastly, uh, you see the active revolution, evolution of new rules. And this is not a revolution, it's an evolution of rules. There's real discipline about how those new rules are formed and implemented, even if it happens on a weekly basis. We talk about relentless con con continuous improvement. And continuous improvement is not just you decide on what you want to change and you change it there's a lot of discipline that goes about maintaining it, communicating it, and sustaining it. Um, there's safety to experiment, so people are clear whether a new rule is in experimentation phase or whether a new way of working is actually now the de facto official new way of working those uh, practice the rules going over to the other uh, uh, polarity. There's also aspects of minimum viable bureaucracy. So people are very aware of and sensitive to introducing um, any additional excessive bureaucracy. So um, they, they look out for those uh, type of behaviors. Now, it's not all uh, doom. It's not all moon. Uh, it's not all uh, roses and honey. Um, if this runs rampant, um, you also run the risk. So, Aurea, why don't you tell us a little bit about risks when overcorrecting, changing new rules? Okay. So, um, what most people are afraid of is look, um, these rules that we have, they're there for a reason. So, when you change the rules willy nilly, what's going to happen is hey, you're going to make mistakes. Because the rule is supposed to be there for your own good. So just follow the bloody rule. Don't keep fiddling with things. Don't make mistakes, right? So we may have um, a lot of difficulty, a lot of challenge when we don't have enough technical competence and therefore we make mistakes that could have been avoided by following the rules more Effectively, uh, we may be too dogmatic. We follow the rules too um, prescriptively and we don't notice uh, that we should be changing. So when overcorrecting, it could be on either side of the correction, either too much or, or too little. We may also have a lot of confusion about, okay, so which rules are not really movable at all and which rules are okay to change? That's also tricky figuring out um, uh, how safe are we to change, right? Over communication, under communication, uh, over burdens and so on. Um, we may have then all sorts of, of churn, uh, change and change and change and change and change. And then, then you get um, all sorts of speed wobbles uh, through so much chain or um, you might use um, the churn as an excuse not to intervene, or you might get uh, distracted or, or feel overwhelmed, or you might get a lot of change fatigue, right? Um, and then um, a change might be uh, getting in the way as a matter of, of obstruction. Um, you see uh, lack of change as an obstruction of the work. You have an excess of caution. Um, you get situations of everybody suffers because somebody uh, abuses the system and therefore new rules get introduced that make life so much harder for the vast majority. We've all seen variations of this um, from time to time. So there's quite a lot of risk um, when um, either not changing enough or changing too much. Uh, and that's, that's the interesting bit, that it's not just about 
changing too much, there's also difficulty when not changing enough. So that then gives us uh, a really good um, opportunity to consider what benefits do we want to retain out of following rules just right. Thank you. So one of the interesting things uh, that came out is this, this sense of someone is keeping us accountable. And this goes both ways. It's not just the oversight keeping the people working on the initiative uh, accountable, but it's also the other way around as well. So there's that tension of oversight. You, you, you notice that we've talked about all of these tensions that, that, that lives in this, um, this zone, uh, a flourishing zone, um, and it's a two-way street. Um, that means that some, someone is able to pull the plug when it's needed or would pull the and on cord and call things out and say something's not working. Um, even though we have these new rules, let's evaluate. Let's not just follow it blindly because it's breaking something somewhere else. And this also allows the freedom of anybody on these two polarities can jump in and help as needed. It also helps when we've got a little bit of a, a break on changing too fast. Um, we've got uh, uh, quite a lot of elements that it helps with uh, vision. It helps with feasibility of changes. So if we do want to bring in changes, it's about understanding the feasibility of it. So again, there's a little bit of change discipline that's uh, coming through there. It also helps with transparency um, and one sources of truth uh, and things like that. And it's compelling, uh, a compelling vision energizes everyone. The next thing that uh, the benefits that we can retain from following the rules is it allows us to be adaptable. And one thing that comes to mind is the metaphor again here of um, why did they invest in better braking technology is so that you can actually go faster. So if you look at the, 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 the brakes on vehicles, uh, especially supercars, how advanced that technology is compared to 50 or 60 years ago, it's so that you can actually go faster. And that comes with, that is the underscoring um, ideas around adaptability. Um, it's to have a willingness to have variable rules by context. It's not just to have a one size fit all uh, view of the rules, but actually different interpretations around that more around having a, a tick box mentality, but actually the rules are more principle based. It's a principles based. It's more based on principles instead of it being down to the letter of the rules. Um, it also helps with uh, oversight is appropriate to the level of risk to the initiative. Again, if you are deciding on a new coffee machine for the office, you don't have to go through the degrees of oversight that you would go through if you decide to invest in a new production plant. Um, so again, scaling the oversight and tuning the oversight to the appropriate context is, uh, is, is one of the benefits that you can retain here. It's also highly strongly purpose-driven. There's a clarity of purpose um, it's support, if clarity of purpose also supports customer focus and uh, provides a unique and shared understanding of the reasons behind things. We also see this as helping with better collaboration. Um, again, because you've got duplex communication or the duplex gamma happening, anybody can talk to anybody. So it's increased opportunity for collaboration um, from uh, between the two, the two levels uh, that we're talking about. Um, maybe consider in the case here is to have an oversight function team as a cross-functional team instead of just a specific set of skills that does things there. And then it helps to build resiliency just by putting on the brakes slightly um, by not changing too fast it helps with resilience. Um, the uh, 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 policies are adaptive, adaptive uh, not set in stone. Um, there is also 
you're getting better as needed. So in certain aspects of your product or your service that you provide, uh, you can get better in providing that product or service as well as the oversight of the delivery of that. Um, and then if one part breaks, there's enough redundancy built into the overall system that it remains resilient, even if one of the uh, aspects of it breaks. And then you would actively go and investigate, have the discipline to figure out why something changes. Now, going uh, back to what's the upside of both, what's that greater purpose statement that we're looking for for both? And this is the overall purpose. What does life look like when we have that harmony or when we have that, we can, the, the balance between not changing too fast or not changing too slow? What does life look like there, Aurea? Well, um... We've clustered this in goodness about starting, goodness about running, goodness about changing, and goodness about stopping, right? So starting things well, having a good on-ramp to high performance. You have just enough discipline to be stable in your efforts and not to take um, full steps. You have um, goodness in running things really well. You have what we call vital engagement. People are actively invested in doing a really great job, um, doing well, um, learning and developing and changing things, not too much, not too little, keeping things interesting. You're not bored. You're having fun. Um, you have the autonomy to apply your own uh, energy, your own inventiveness to uh, what's happening. Um, confidence and trust is being built. Um, we actually achieve organizational ambidextry uh, or ambidexterity. Um, that means that uh, the people in the oversight uh, function can influence things well and can support the initiative really, really well. Uh, we also want to have the ability to, to change things well, pivot well, uh, don't stop learning, keep open dialogue, have less waste, overburden, and absurdity in relationships, and have both the operations community and the product development community operate in a nice, harmonious um, ecosystem. So changing well, not finger pointing, having really good collegial um, collaboration. Uh, change is really well understood and change is more broadly engaged with beyond the realms of, say, uh, an information technology community. You actually have change permeating throughout the broader space of the organization and things get pulled into effective implementation into the hands of end users out there. Now, um, you also want to be able to stop things really well. In other words, uh, when you discover that a particular initiative, hmm, it's not worth it anymore, learn how to let go of the sunk cost uh, bias and learn how to stop and refocus, develop that skill to kill initiatives, learn how to decommission effectively and let go of um, systems or elements that are no longer useful as opposed to hoarding them and keeping them around um, just in case, if you will. A lot of organizations suffer quite a bit uh, from this habit of accumulating historical um, artifacts, shall we say. So notice how all of these elements of um, changing things well, running things well, stopping things well, they are inspired by an aspect of simplicity. In other words, I don't want to have too much stuff. I want to have just enough stuff. I want to have um, enough clarity. And clarity comes from understanding things well. Understanding things well happens when we've simplified our, um, our perception, our, our vision of what is actually happening. And therefore, we can make sense, we can reason, we can interact with what's going on. Now, here, maybe we should make a distinction between simplistic and simple. 
When we say something is simplistic, uh, a simplistic understanding, that means we've oversimplified. We've missed some critical aspect. If we have a simple understanding, then that means that we haven't lost anything significant. Our understanding is simple. It has the minimum amount of parts. We have reduced our way of thinking about things in a minimum amount of parts, and we haven't lost anything significant. So um, for instance, uh, if I'm trying to describe how uh, a billiard ball rolls um, on a pool table, Newtonian mechanics is good enough. It's a simple enough explanation for the dynamics of billiard ball um, interactions. But if I'm trying to apply Newtonian mechanics at the scale of a galaxy or a solar system, mm, things don't quite work uh, well enough. There are all sorts of really weird and interesting effects that happen where um, relativistic effects intervene and therefore Newtonian mechanics don't, um, don't work anymore. So Newtonian physics is a simplistic understanding of physics when applied at a galactic scale. But a perfectly reasonable understanding of physics when applied at a pool table scale. So similarly, uh, our understandings of organizations may be simplistic at certain scales and good enough at other scales. So when we have really good um, harmony between the oversight function and the initiative, then we understand, is our understanding simple enough or has it run the risk of becoming simplistic? In other words, whoops, we're missing some critical aspects. So understanding simplicity is really, really important because that helps us to articulate value. And again, value, not just from one perspective, but as an integration of numerous different perspectives so that, that we have a sustainable uh, growth and a sustainable understanding of how do we get better. Uh, and that uh, is the general aspiration that we create great value, we sustain great value, and we pivot when we must uh, open up uh, new opportunities and new ways of delivering value. What are we afraid of, Aldo? Right, so there's all sorts of behaviors uh, from um, when this uh, balance or when the uh, polarity is out of balance. And both parties, the combined fears is around dogma, loss, harmful conflict, lack of control, incompetence, failure, and some really interesting things around measurement. So with dogma, we notice that uh, one or both sides may fear an overcorrection or too much dogma in their diet or too much dogma in whatever it is that they're trying to attempt. And there's all sorts of um, interesting uh, behaviors around dogma. Um, so all the way from avoiding change just because it's different, uh, all the way to increase bureaucracy. Um, people treat some of these changes or some of these new rules or ways of working as just a checkbox exercise. So one or both of the sides may fear that, um, is that we'll slip into overly dogmatic approaches to things. The next thing is associated with loss. And there's more a personal type trigger about feeling loss. And um, we talked here about scarf dimensions triggered. So if you don't know about scarf, um, it's from the Nero Leadership Institute. It's a really handy model to look at what triggers people um, in situations. Uh, there's, a, there's a few dimensions uh, under the scarf model. Go have a look at that. That's quite an interesting thing. We also notice that both these um, parties end up fearing any of the harmful conflict behaviors that's listed here. Either there's too much apathy with change, or again, it's too much uh, power hungriness or lust for power, um, or um, people may be too invested into a specific uh, route or a specific change option, and that could lead to. 
uh, harmful conflict. We've touched on some of this, these aspects with the personal, um, res, uh, the, the, the personal interest versus organizational um, interest uh, polarity, but we, we do see some um, forms of um, harmful conflict that people may uh, want to avoid. What we also notice is this real sense of lack of control um, is that the oversight function may feel that they're losing control of the initiative and they don't have a say, they don't provide value to the initiative. All the over, over initiative people may feel that they are losing control about any of the um, autonomy that they may have about what types of changes they can bring in their ways of working, et cetera. Um, sometimes it becomes a real argy bargy um, if you want to change, let's say, something on your definition of ready or definition of done. Um, and, and because it may trigger a sense of loss of control by either or, or by one of the parties or, or both. We also see a fear of failure, and this is a repeating pattern in all the balances, <coughs> is a sense of fear of failure. Um, and the, that brings around quite a lot of fear of this uh, normalized dysfunctions. Um, bloated bureaucracies, uh, extra bureaucratic rules being brought in uh, when people fear failure, uh, a strong sense of loss of purpose, or there would be repercussions. People may fear the repercussions of failure that, um, that may happen. So they will hide, hide the evidence or, you know, fake it till you make it or things like that without admitting things. There is also aspects of incompetence. People fear incompetence. Um, so you may find people uh, living, uh, being poster, poster boys for imposter syndrome. Um, maybe you're making decisions on the one hand for a product without actually understanding the impact on the business side. So people actually fear that. And then lastly is we... We see all sorts of funny things when it comes to measurements. Um, if you tell me how I'm going to behave, you, you need to tell me how you're going to uh, measure me. Is that type of thinking? Um, it's not clear how people may be measured. And again, um, that again brings around certain degrees of fear. Horia, tell us a little bit about what types of actions and skills is it that we can actually look at in order to remain above that line, have a, a balanced perspective between, mm. between these two? Yeah. Well, uh, one of the things that we found is that, unfortunately, um, fairly frequently, the oversight communities are thrown together with Mm, relatively little investment in um, understanding each other um, sufficiently well and operating as an actual high performance team. So chartering the oversight function as an actual high performance team is a tremendous benefit because all of a sudden people, rather than joining into that oversight function, uh, as if uh, we're getting into a highly charged uh, personality contest where I want my idea to be heard. I want to campaign for my uh, community or my um, um, silo, uh, if you will, and uh, therefore potentially getting into a, a very highly charged and conflict-based uh, relationship. If you take much more of a, let's understand what our shared purpose is. Let's figure out how do we engage and develop strong trust uh, amongst ourselves and figure out what context um, are we aiming to, to address that um, could be tremendously beneficial. So all of a sudden we figure out, aha, well, we have clarity on how uh, are we going to engage as an oversight uh, community. We know what the rules of oversight are. We know how to engage better with the initiatives. Um, we um, don't take exception, uh, basically. Uh, what we have is what 
the um, initiatives themselves benefit tremendously from chartering activities. So we're simply uh, following the rule of when you have a new initiative, you will charter. You will follow that for the oversight uh, community as well. Now, um, another cluster of uh, actions and skills to consider is around principles, understanding and being clear about our principles, particularly with respect to balancing, um, shall we say, conservatism, keeping things the same with liberalism, changing things. And this is a really interesting tension uh, to balance because we cannot afford to have things frozen and just stay one way, right? There needs to be a gradual transformation. And we cannot afford to have things just chaotic to say, oh, do whatever, mate. That's not right. So we need to figure out what's our definition of awesome. And in that definition of awesome, how much of it is kind of be this way and how much of it is but change, keep, keep on improving. It has to do with an understanding that perfect should be used as a verb, perfecting things as opposed to perfect, right? There is no perfect anything. There's no perfect process. There's no perfect product. There's only an opportunity to perfect our skills, our abilities, and so on. Now, there are also a whole range of other uh, practices around um, shaping our implementation of, um, of rules. So we have here examples of looking at systems thinking and theory of constraints, um, considering something like an obeya room. An obeya room is uh, a location where we can have uh, a rapid visual confirmation of here are the specific um, improvement initiatives that are currently underway. We might have some A3 um, diagrams captured that give us a lot of in-depth insight. We can zoom into specific activities. We can see how they interact and how they overlap. Uh, that then uh, ties into the A3 work and the, uh, the kata um, continuous improvement approaches. Um, you see their reference also to uh, strategy deployment, Hoshin uh, Kanri. Um, and as a result, um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about all of these practices. Now, uh, in future episodes, we can um, take uh, each of these areas and explore them in a bit more detail, make it uh, a little bit more accessible, hopefully. Um, now, there's a whole cluster around structure and how do we approach um, the management of authority. Um, the... the human democracy and corporate rebel um, communities have identified quite a range of alternative options in terms of um, structural arrangement. In other words, there are already numerous examples of organizations around the globe that are thriving, are doing really, really well with delegated oversight, with micro enterprises and uh, a, a more distributed and well-coordinated, more, a more federal approach to, um, to, to leadership. So how you structure your approach to, to leadership and oversight will have a profound impact on how can you balance this need for sustaining certain rules and at the same time valuing the improvement of some rules. Now, for the last cluster of activities, I will uh, draw your attention to this idea of the duplex gemba. Um, what we mean by this is don't think of just uh, having leaders visit the gemba, uh, the place of work of the people in the initiative, but also from time to time invite a few of the, of the people engaged in the initiative to visit the gemba of the people inv involved in the oversight uh, function. In other words, get an ambassador if you will, into the oversight uh, function so that they notice what are the challenges, what are the difficulties, what are the obstacles, how is the oversight community struggling with various concerns? Because that then develops a far deeper empathy within the 
um, initiative team to say, oh, wow, we understand now why they want us to follow this rule rather than that rule. Because there's this um, other implication that we weren't aware of, and, there, and there's that constraint and that market opportunity that needs to be uh, accounted for and so on. So all of a sudden, you have a much better understanding between the initiative and the oversight function by investing in this kind of uh, duplex gemba uh, technique. Now, maybe one more um, example to give here in, in terms of determining great value and, and having great skills of value. You see here a note on purpose process people. This has to do with as an oversight practitioner, when you're charged with investigating a particular value stream, the first thing uh, that you'd want to do is focus on the purpose. What is the purpose of that value stream? Because if the purpose is suspect, then we may be able to do away with the value stream altogether. So first focus on purpose. That's a really great skill. Ask yourself, why are we doing this in the first place? And be unafraid, be curious and, and unafraid. Um, when you've clarified, yes, okay, this purpose is valid, it's important, it really makes a lot of sense, then look at the actual process. Go and visit. Go take a gamma walk and notice and make notes and ask questions and show respect for the people involved in the process and understand really deeply what's the actual process. And finally, to conclude your evaluation, consider the actual people involved. Because Processes don't exist in a vacuum. Processes exist and are effective by having specific people. If specific people are missing, humans are usually not so much interchangeable. Different people have different balances of skills. And yes, much of the time you may be able to get mm, similar results if you let a person go and hire another person. But to be truly highly effective, you really need to tailor your process and your approach to the skills and capabilities of specific practitioners. Uh, humans are not sprockets to be sort of changed about um, fungibly uh, within the machinery of organizations. Humans are um, wonderful and mysterious and, uh, and changeable. So therefore, if you conclude your evaluation by showing good respect, forming trusting relationships, and understanding the skills, the competence, the capabilities of the actual people engaged in the process, then you'll have no difficulty in keeping a process flow and uh, a value stream operating really in peak effectiveness. Aurea, before you move on, um, if you just go to our 20, uh, the, the episodes board, um, there's a guy that wrote a blog. Um, his website is Facile Things. Uh, I've created the link there. If you go a little bit to the right. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, in this blog post, I just want to latch on to what Horia talked about, the principles part of it. Um, I found this really fascinating. He says that rules are imposed from the outside and must be obeyed to avoid incurring some kind of penalty. When principles are internal and, uh, and force you to do what you think is right or correct. So rules appear when principles are not very clear. So working under rules is a source of stress and working under principles is natural. So if you want to create something worthwhile, in other words, keep up in the top, uh, in, uh, keep, keep things uh, above the line there, base it on principles and forget the rules. I found that really fascinating perspective. Um, it's quite a useful thing there. And I've included the link there that you can go have a look at. The blog is called Principle Versus Rules. Wonderful. So um, tell us more, Aldo, about what warning signs might we keep an eye out for? Okay, so as usual, uh, look out for not just how people behave, but listen to how they talk. It gives quite a lot of away about what the underlying thinking is uh, or what, what is busy happening there. Um, look for um, many surprises, good or bad, um, but you'll see that uh, either the product value is suspect or the delivery surprises in delivery. We've gone live and now suddenly we have all of these surprises out there. Um, uh, you also see that 
uh, back channels are used to get to the truth instead of actually people uh, facing up or uh, speaking, speaking the truth. Notice uh, also aspects of confusion. Um, you probably, uh, it, it's either going to be very low noise, so it's either a, a vacuum, or you'll notice lots of noise and you try and uh, it's difficult to find the signal in either of those circumstances. Um, look at mismatched expectations, people not really understanding um, things in the same way. Um, they may look at the same thing, but see two different uh, things. So con consider that as well. Those are dead giveaways. Um, look out what are the behaviors when the pressure starts piling on. I've noticed that people or decision makers uh, sometimes bring in more rules in an attempt to assert more control over that situation. So look out for that overly burdensome uh, bureaucracy. Um, look at what happens behind the scenes. What's the, um, what's the type of plays people do uh, behind the scenes in the back channels, the, non, the unofficial channels uh, when the uh, pressure piles on. Other warning signs uh, to look out for is uh, aspects of when the initiative is running amok. So you see, uh, you see something like tokenism or compliance theater. Um, if you've ever been to, a, uh, if you've heard of Kabuki, um, it is just pretend. Um, it's just a, a People are going through the motions just because they have to go through the motions. There's no, there's no meaning behind it. There's no value in it. Look for loop people actually um, making use of loopholes um, or people not showing up. Um, yeah. So uh, another dead giveaway uh, to potentially dig into a little bit is to look out for task boards on task boards on task boards for a single team. Um, there's no actual Kanban, just a list of tasks that's categorized across multiple task boards. That's another dead giveaway. Look for unreliable Kaizen. And I spoke a little bit about earlier about non, not having discipline in continuous improvement um, and Kaizen. And that you'll notice quite a lot of behaviors when that discipline is missing. There's potential technical debt itself of the oversight site, a, a role and, and capabilities that they need or work that needed have done. Um, the oversight community don't have their own retrospectives or there's no retrospectives about oversight failures. Um, there's no improvement backlog for uh, oversight and there's no actual proof that the improvements that they've made is actually, has actually made a difference or has actually worked. The um, lessons learned or uh, uh, is just a, another tick checkbox exercise. Nothing materially has changed or improved from previous initiatives. It's just a tick box. The process says we have to do a lessons learned. We've done the lessons learned. Tick, I can close off this. Um, so look out for those types of behaviors. And it can be very subtle uh, as well in some cases. Meetings and workshops run a Kimbo. Um, so you make resolutions in meetings, but nobody follows it up. People show up late. That's the first sign I always look out for is what is the behavior on either side of uh, 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 the oversight function or the actual initiative? Who regularly turns up late? What's the, what's the trends there? Or if they turn up at all? Um, no clear agendas. It's a talk fest or a complaint uh, a session, whatever. Um, watch out for that uh, as well. 
there could be signs of conflict. And again, not just, uh, it's, it's also in the way that people could be talking, it could be competitive, it could be passive aggressive. Listen out for the us versus them language. They didn't do this, they didn't approve this, or they didn't come to us and ask our input. Look out for those um, little giveaways around uh, conflict. People could be defensive, and like I said, passive aggressive. Look out for bureaucratic agendas. Um, these are dead giveaway is that people are playing, uh, the, uh, playing their own uh, agendas by Im, uh, implementing additional bureaucracy or intentionally creating crises. Uh, who stands to gain? Um, what's the, uh, the, the, the level of burden on the people that needs to actually fulfill that uh, oversight function? Are they overburdened? Um, and also, um, <laughs> there's a thing, maintain the problem at all costs. If you've read the, uh, uh, the seven rules of bureaucracy, that's the number one um, uh, rule for the seven rules of bureaucracy is maintain the problem at all costs. So look out for that, uh, those bureaucratic agendas at play there. And then lastly, look out for signs of inertia. Uh, again, of uh, not of practicing Kaizen is yes, we have to improve, but uh, we don't want to improve. There's a there's a cartoon about the manager asking uh, the 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 uh, the workers who wants change, and everybody's hand goes up. And in the next uh, part of it is who wants to lead the change, and there's no hands up. Uh, it's look out for those types of behaviors. Um, look out for um, people blocking changes, uh, you know, either by sleuth or directly or indirectly. You do see some of that behaviors. I tried to bring some changes through in an organization a few years ago. And I, it was so obvious the plays that uh, some people made in order to block those changes because they perceived that they would end up losing more than they losing their power base in the organization. Um, also look out for long, uh, long cycle times on decisions or decision latency. That's another aspect when it comes to as a, as a giveaway, decisions on implementing changes um, uh, or actually uh, changing, changing something look out for those cycle times or decision latency. And that's another dead giveaway that you need to go dig a little bit deeper into um, what is going on there. And that is the um, balance, the third balance that's got to do with follow the new rules and change the rules associated with the bigger, uh, the, the bigger, uh, um, tension between exploring and innovating and maintaining competent capability. Aurea, what are we looking forward? What are we looking to next time? Right, uh, so the next time we will conclude our preliminary exploration of adaptive oversight with the safety courage balance. That's gonna tie this all together um, quite neatly. And after that, we can look forward to a range of interviews with various practitioners from around the world uh, that will share with us their insights, their experiences, their journeys that uh, should hopefully promise to be quite interesting, quite fascinating. And again, the, uh, the request or the, the offer goes out there. If you're working in organizational change or you have battle scars in change when you have to implement or try to implement new rules, and then it gets changed and there's a little bit of an argy-bargy or um, some, come tell us some good stories as well about how the oversight function and the initiative has actually collaborated uh, together. Come share those ideas, come share those experiences. It's pretty useful. By all means, come and uh, contact us. Uh, we're very happy to, uh, in, uh, to, to arrange um, 
uh, time to speak to you to see how we can turn that into an interview to explore this tension a little bit further. Thank you very much. That was a rat's a wrap for episode nine. I'm Aldo Roll. And I'm Horace Lushansky. See you soon.